Hey everyone, and welcome back. So today we're going to be doing an update where we're looking at the best games that have released so far in 2021. I know it doesn't seem like it, but already more than half the year has actually passed, which means it's a pretty good time to refresh and take a look at what games you might have missed over the last six months. But not only that, since I'm switching to a numerical rating system, it's a perfect time to set a baseline on what I would rate probably the best games that I've played over the last six months. And at the same time, a lot of these games that I've played through, I haven't had the time to do official reviews on the channel yet, and most likely because new games keep coming out, we won't be able to circle back to them. But a lot of these are some quite amazing games that really deserve a little time to shine, and that's what we're going to be doing today. So now, get ready, because today, I have over 16 games to look at that I would have most likely rated at 8 or above that has already released in 2021 for the Nintendo Switch. And as we go through the video, I'll be talking a little bit about my new rating system so that in future reviews, you'll have a good basis on how to judge the game. Now, just before we get started on the official list, I just want to remind you all that if you do like this content, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. So now let's get started with Curse of the Dead Gods. And by the way, I'm going to be going with the lowest rated games. For example, Curse of the Dead Gods would have been rated an 8 out of 10 in my opinion. And we'll be working towards the higher rated games. Now, the reason why Curse of the Dead Gods is getting an 8 out of 10 isn't only because of the game. In my rating system, price is always a really important factor. And right now, in the dungeon crawler roguelite genre, there are a lot of games available. And I would say that most games are living in the shadow of Hades right now that has an incredible, incredible gameplay mechanic. And Curse of the Dead Gods does a lot of things right and does resemble a lot Hades in a lot of ways, at the same time throwing in its own pitch. The only problem is that what really got me into Hades is those little tidbits of storyline that really push you on to your next run to get just a little bit further. And I did think that for the moment in Curse of the Dead Gods, that was a little bit lacking, which is why I'm rating it a little lower than maybe if those other games wouldn't currently be out. But nonetheless, if you're looking for another amazing roguelite dungeon crawler, Curse of the Dead Gods is a definite game that will not disappoint. Now next today, also at an 8 out of 10 point, I would have put Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 plus 2. And this comes down really to pricing. This is an amazing remake of two original skateboarding games. I personally, I enjoyed the games, but I wasn't a huge fan back in the day. And that maybe also is part of my scoring on this game today. But for both remakes, now I do know there's a base edition around $40 or the digital deluxe around $50. I do find that it's quite a high asking price for two remakes that have already come out on other consoles almost a year ago. But then again, I do know that this could easily be marked all the way up to a point higher if you are really into skateboarding games. So this is one of those games that I will be rating at an 8 out of 10, but I do mention that a lot of people might put this one slightly higher depending on your affinity for this style of gameplay. But nonetheless, these are two quality remakes, and if you are really into the skateboarding environment, well then, once again, this is an easy pickup for this year, and one that I would have placed at an 8 out of 10. Now next, we're already moving on to the 8.5s, and the first entry at this point is Rising Hell. Now this is another roguelite adventure game, however, it does enough originality to set itself apart from the Shadow of Hades, as I mentioned earlier, and also it's at an amazing price point of only $10 regularly. And while saying it's doing it originally, number one, it has some beautiful pixelated graphics. You all know if you follow the channel regularly, I really love pixelated graphics, but on top of it, rather than taking the general 
dungeon crawler aesthetic, you are scaling a tower. So everything is an adventure vertically. And at the same time, it doesn't feel like any other roguelite game out there, which is a lot to say because we are getting tons and tons right now. But this is one to really set aside and that deserves that extra 0.5. So if you're really looking into a new roguelike to get into, I would say that Rising Hell should definitely also be at the top of your list. Now the next game that also released in 2021 that is at the 8.5 mark, we have Ghost and Goblins Resurrection. Now this is a game series that I was waiting for a sequel. Ghost and Goblins and Ghouls and Ghosts, which was its original sequel, are two games that I loved and played tons growing up as a kid. One thing though, the series wasn't really approachable for a casual player. And I was worried that this remake would take the same approach. And what I love about it is that they did both scenarios. You have multiple difficulty modes and the base difficulty mode is really great for a casual player that just wants to work his way through the game and see everything that there is to offer in it. However, for those that are looking for a challenge, let me tell you that the hardest difficulty modes are going to be very frustrating, very challenging and extremely, extremely honest to the original. The only thing is that even those stronger difficulty modes have nonetheless had quality of life upgrades like the infinite lives and being able to start over from checkpoint to checkpoint and not having to restart the stages over and over again. So nonetheless, it is still a very difficult experience, but they've made it a very good experience overall for every type of player out there. And second, I want to really give them kudos because I was worried that this was going to be a simple remake of the first one. And although it has the same vibes as the first one, pretty much all the stage layouts are original, but at the same time, throwbacks to those original entries. Now, the next game on the list is one that I love to talk about because it was such an unexpected surprise for 2021. And that is Blue Fire that I would also put at the 8.5 score. Now, this game basically melds Souls-like combat with Zelda 3D exploration and on top of it mixes in incredibly difficult platforming. And you get a general tiny little bit of an idea of what to expect from Blue Fire. The only sort of actual disappointing part to this game is that it wasn't long enough. The campaign actually ended a little bit too short. And at the end of the game, it almost seemed like a rush to the finish. I am really, really hoping that this game will eventually get either a sequel or some free DLC. Honestly, this developer is coming out with some great, great games and Blue Fire is among the best. By the way, there were a few technical snafus when the game came out. It did have an occasional crash here and there, but I am glad to say that at least in my last few playthroughs, I've been seeing less and less of those issues. So the game has been patched up quite a bit. And if you were worried about that, I would say that now would be a great time to give it a whirl. Now next, also at the 8.5, we have another huge surprise in my opinion for 2021. We have Smelter. Now this game is a spiritual successor, I would say, to the Act Razor series, but not the second one, the first one that really blended 2D platforming with RTS stages. Yes, real time strategy stages. And if you're like me and you're actually a fan of those two genres, this game is like a game sent from heaven because it melds those two things very well. In my personal opinion though, if we go back to Smelter more specifically, the 2D platforming stages are the centerpiece of this game. The RTS stages are good nonetheless, but I would definitely say that the 2D platforming stages take center stage and the RTS stages in a future entry in the series, I would like them to see developed maybe just a little bit further because the gameplay was a little bit too simplistic and repetitive. But nonetheless, Smelter is an amazing entry. And if you're into one of these styles, both of these styles, I would definitely give it a try. Worst comes to worst, you can always wait for a sale if you're sort of on the fence for this mix. Now, next on the list, still at that 8.5 score, we have the Ninja Gaiden Master Collection. Now, this collection groups together all three Ninja Gaidens from the Sigma era. Now, if you haven't played these games yet, they are very challenging 3D action games. 
And when I'm saying very challenging, I would say that the first one is the most challenging, second one is in the middle, and the third one is the most action-oriented one. Some people will still find it difficult, but I would still say it is nowhere near the difficulty of the first two entries in the series. I'm putting this collection on the list mostly on the power of the first two entries. Those are really the two games also that I would say are best experienced in this collection. The third one is a decent entry, but it doesn't really, in my opinion, have the same feeling as the first two Ninja Gaiden entries. There's a second factor as well for the Switch version of this collection. The third one does have quite a few technical glitches. They are present in the second one as well, but not as currently as in the third entry in the series. Meaning that unfortunately it makes the experience for the moment a little lackluster on the third entry. I'm still really crossing my fingers for Koei Tecmo to really patch the game up and have the second two entries run even smoother on the Nintendo Switch. And I'm trusting them to do this because this collection could actually score a 9 or above if they smooth out those issues on the two last entries in the series. It's actually the only thing holding back the collection, in my opinion, from an even higher score. Now next, at 8.5, we have a game that probably needs very little introduction to a lot of people. We have Monster Hunter Rise, which is the latest entry in the Monster Hunter series on the Nintendo Switch. And look, even though I'm giving it an 8.5, that is an amazing score in my opinion, and it is an amazing game. Don't forget that price point is an important factor in the way I rate games. So obviously, if I'm rating a game that costs $5, it's not going to need to do as much to hit an 8.5 as a full-priced $60 game. And at $60, hitting an 8.5 is quite an amazing feat, and Monster Hunter Rise definitely deserves that score. Because in my opinion, it is one of the best Monster Hunter entries ever in the series. And also, it is probably one of the more approachable ones so far. So if you're a new player to the Monster Hunter series, I would say that this is one of the perfect areas to jump into the action. On top of it, they've done a lot to streamline the action in Monster Hunter. Because if you look at the older series, if you're not really into the genre, it took you quite a bit to warm up to the actual gameplay. In this one, I do find that they did a lot to make it more inviting to that action sequence and that streamlined hunting experience. But nonetheless, Monster Hunter Rise is an excellent entry, definitely deserves a score of 8.5 this year, and if you haven't tried it yet, and you don't mind that $60 price point, I would definitely say this is a good place to drop your money, because you could have hundreds and hundreds of hours of gameplay out of this one game alone. Now next, we have a game that I find didn't get enough attention for its Switch port. We have Crash Bandicoot 4, also at that 8.5 score. Number one, I want to give the developer kudos for releasing the game at $40 rather than the $60 full price that other consoles got. But nonetheless, Crash Bandicoot 4, in my opinion, is worth all $40 of its price point. And I am a huge fan of Crash Bandicoot. I've been playing since the release of the original on the PS1. And I've got to tell you that Crash Bandicoot 4 would be the second best Crash out of all four of them, in my opinion only behind the first one because it's such a classic and I have so much nostalgia for the first Crash Bandicoot and also its remake. But after that, I would place Crash Bandicoot 4, 2, and then 3 in last place. But all those games are pretty great, and if you haven't played the remake collection of Crash Bandicoot yet, that is another definite pickup in my opinion on the Switch. But if we get back to Crash Bandicoot 4, Honestly, I didn't think we would actually be getting this port to the Switch because I thought that technically it would be an issue and they would have to sacrifice too much. But I'm going to tell you, we do not. Of course, there's a little bit of graphic fidelity that we lose on Crash Bandicoot 4. And during the fast moving sections, that fidelity drops a little bit. But overall, the experience of Crash Bandicoot 4 is a very good one on the Switch. And the portability factor, as usual, is a huge selling point, and I would still pick the game up on the Switch before any other console. Now, our last game at the 8.5 mark, before we move on to the 9s, is going to be Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. 
Now, I talk about this game regularly. If you watch my sales, every time it's on sale, I suggest it. At $15, you're getting an incredible retro beat em up. And honestly, I was hoping to rate this game even higher. The only thing that is currently holding this game back is the online multiplayer that is still janky in the game. And it's really disappointing because Ubisoft has the servers to support this game. They have a lot of online play. You, they could fix this game up and give it amazing online experience. And that is the sole thing holding this game back from a nine or above. But if not, if you like retro beat-em-ups, if you have people to play up, play with in local co-op, this is an amazing, amazing game to pick up. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is worth every penny of the $15 it's sold at. And when you pick it up on sale, it easily becomes a top, top pick. So now we move on to the nines. And I'm going to tell you that my first two nines are probably going to be controversial picks at this score. But nonetheless, we're going to go through them. The first one of these two is Super Faust 2. Now I talk about this game regularly and it is a game that needs to be experienced to understand why it becomes so addictive and so fun. Now, number one, the price point is incredible at its regular sale price of $10, but you can very regularly pick it up at only $2 like it is on sale right now. Now this is an infinite roguelite I'm going to say platformer, but it has a really original control scheme where basically you only use two buttons, which is the left and right of the D-pad, or uh, basically you can use the bumper buttons at the top of your controller, and your character basically bounces back and forth, sort of like a pinball-like mechanic. And basically, with that mechanic, you can actually send your character all the way around the screen. You can have him fly infinitely. It is quite incredible what you can do once you get the control scheme down. But not only that, it has a really original premise where you basically have to slam directly into the enemies to kill them. You can jump in giant battle mech suits. There are power-ups available. Basically, this game with a super simple concept offers so much replayability at such a low, low price, and like I said, becomes extremely addicting that there is no way I could score this game any lower. But nonetheless, as I said, this is a game that you should definitely give a try at only $2. If you've ever liked a roguelite experience, definitely give Super Fouls 2 a try. Next will be my second, maybe controversial pick to be giving a 9 out of 10, but that will be Mighty Goose. Now don't forget, as I said earlier, price point is an important thing and a $20 game does not have to do as much as a $60 game to hit a 9 out of 10. But Mighty Goose is a game that I would spend $20 on at any point, no questions asked. It had so much nostalgic fun for me, evoking series like Gunstar Superheroes, Metal Slug, and even comedic action like the Battletoad series. And on top of it, even in its upgrade system, it has throwbacks to other crazy series out there such as the Ultra Instinct upgrade named after Dragon Ball Super, or then again, the Buster upgrade that is named obviously after the Mega Man series. And honestly, the only negative thing I would really have to say about Mighty Goose is that overall, there isn't enough of it. And the game maybe ends a little bit too shortly, which is why I think some people had a slight problem with the $20 price point. But if you are the type of person that enjoys replaying a game, trying to get a higher score on the stages you've already finished, you have quite a bit of gameplay available with Mighty Goose. And at the same time, you can always try different upgrade paths at any time for your character, which will change up the gameplay a lot. Other people will say that maybe you lose track of the action with the crazy over-the-top animations, but you know what? To me, that was part of the fun in Mighty Goose. It's that it went over the top in everything it did. Now, next on the list, at a 9 out of 10, we have Kaze and the Wild Masks. Now, if you're a fan of 2D platformers and you haven't played this one yet, do yourself a favor, play it as soon as possible. This is basically very heavily influenced by the Donkey Kong Country series. So heavily influenced that most of the mechanics, if you've played through the series since its origins, you'll pretty much recognize them all. But the only thing is that they do it and they actually hold up the quality of a first party game. In my opinion, 
with the beautiful animations and the tight controls and the level designs that seem must have been play tested to an infinite amount, Kaze and the Wild Masks really holds up almost the quality to a Nintendo first party title. And honestly, if you haven't played this one yet, trust me, 2D platform fans, this one is one you should not miss for this year. You can wait for a sale if you want to, but if not, I'm saying it is worth the $30 price point, especially if you give yourself the challenge to unlock all the extras, because honestly, it is definitely, definitely worth it. Now, last, with a score of 9 on our lifts, we have Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. Now, like I said earlier, don't forget, price point is important. So obviously, if you look at the overall quality of Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury, it's a first party title. And we all know that Nintendo means quality gameplay. And there are hours of fun to be had in this collection as well. However, at the same time, for $60, I find that a 9 out of 10 is a very fair score for this. And actually, if it wasn't for Bowser's Fury, I would have maybe given it an 8 or 8.5, but Bowser's Fury is such an original add-on to this game that it actually pushes the score higher. If you don't know, Bowser's Fury is an open world style design of Mario game and is actually a completely separate game from Super Mario 3D World, which is the main game in this collection. And basically Bowser's Fury is an amazing experience, Super Mario 3D World is a first party Mario game and among one of the really good ones. So you know what? 9 out of 10 was an easy score for this game. And if you're looking for a first party title to pick up, you love 3D platformers. Well, don't look any further. Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury is definitely a game worth picking up so far in 2021. Now with only two games left to go on our list, we're going to be looking next at the only game to get a 9.5, which is Cyber Shadow. And Cyber Shadow, if you've been following the channel for a while, you'll know that it is probably one of my favorite 2D platformers, all games combined on the Nintendo Switch. And I think that this game has a level of genius behind it that a lot of people aren't giving it credit for. It is an almost perfectly crafted game. Number one, it evokes a lot of nostalgia with the Ninja Gaiden-esque type of gameplay. And fair warning, it is very challenging, but I do find very challenging in a very fair way. And what I love about the challenges in this game is that each and every challenge helps you grow as a player in the game. Meaning that every time you have a massive challenge in front of you, it is to help you develop a new skill of gameplay to face a later challenge because almost every boss fight is going to evoke the difficulties you had to work through through the stage to actually get to it. And that is a genius level of design that I think a lot of people don't give this game credit for. And why I'm scoring it so high and why I think I enjoyed it so much, it's that every time I look back through the level and I looked at the boss fight I just beat, I'm like, that's why they made those difficult sections, to make sure you're ready for the boss fight, which is why I find it's an incredibly fair game. If you want a challenge and you haven't played this game yet, definitely click Cyber Shadow up. Now last on our list, if there was only one game at 9.5, that means there is a 10 out of 10 game on our list, and it is right in front of us with Fez. Now, I know this is a game that is new to the Switch, but not new in general. But trust me, if you haven't played it yet, this is a truly amazing game. And if you look at what my definition of a 10 out of 10 is, it's a genre defining game. Well, Fez is that game. If you haven't played it yet, it's a game where you can phase between different perspectives to help you go through different puzzles. And it is so original and so incredible as a concept that it is really worth that 10 out of 10. Not only just because of the concept, because of the fun behind it. So if you've ever liked puzzle platformers or even just platformers in general, I tell you, give Fez a try. And not only that, at only $15, this game has some amazing quality behind it. 
The graphics are simple, but the gameplay becomes incredibly, incredibly diverse. It's insane how many ways they've thought of using those simple concepts, but in new ways in each and every stage. This game, I just can't praise enough. If you haven't played it yet, do yourself a favor, drop everything else and pick up Fez. It is a true 10 out of 10 game. So that is pretty much it today for our list of top games released so far in 2021. Let me know what you think about these type of update videos. Would you like to maybe see them more often? Maybe every two or three months then rather than every six months? Let me know down below in the comments. Also, as I pointed to a little bit earlier on the channel in other videos, I will be trying to do more full reviews of games as time goes by. I'm really trying to work that better into the schedule and have more full reviews for all the games I'm playing. But anyway, just on the way out, as I said at the beginning of the video, don't forget that if you did like the content, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe if you aren't already and hit that notification bell so you know when all my future content comes out. And as usual, I hope I'll see all of you in my next video.